Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Captain Jake Brinaldi. I work in the Modern War Institute in the Department of Military Instruction. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to welcome everybody to our first guest speaker of the new semester. We had a war council yesterday, but this is our first actual lecture uh, of the semester, so thank you for coming. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from Colonel James Work. Colonel Work graduated from West Point in 1995 and has served in various leadership and staff positions in both the conventional force and within special operations. Beyond the operational force, Colonel Work served as an aide-de-camp for the Secretary of the Army and spent time on the Joint Staff. He's also a graduate of the Marine Corps War College and George, uh, Georgetown University's Public Policy School. Colonel Work currently commands the Falcon Brigade, uh, 2nd Brigade, 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg. Uh, today's presentation for, for us at MWI and DMI is particularly significant because we don't actually end up getting a lot of current brigade commanders to come in to speak. Um, and not only that, his most recent experience as a brigade commander in Iraq is obviously something that we all have our eyes on uh, as a pretty significant event going on out in the world. So his experience recently, very current, is invaluable to both us as sort of the second graduating class, the captains and majors that will go out to the force relatively soon, and for you as cadets who will be, you know, lieutenants very shortly uh, in this operating environment doing these things for men like Colonel Work. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Colonel Work. Okay, thanks. All right. Hey, I want to I want to thank Colonel Oslin for inviting me out to do this. And uh, when I look around the room here, it's an important story we'll start with. The Army isn't made up of people, it is people. And next to doing your duty, works opinion, next to doing your duty, relationships are the coin of the realm. And when I look around, this is kind of what I see, just so you understand who I am and where we are on this. I see several of my West Point classmates over here. Thanks for coming out, guys. Dr. Crowder, very good to see you again, sir. Uh, Captain Cottle and I served together in Afghanistan where she worked for me as my battalion intel officer for about six weeks during a transition in Host Province in 2013. Brother Brinkerhoff and I stomped around Baghdad back in 2006 to 2007 during the Bush administration's troop surge. We've got a couple of my former paratroopers here, uh, paratroopers for life, excuse me. So Sydney's here and Henry's here and they both served in the Falcon Brigade with us. Uh, as we work our way around, the, and then, uh, you know, Colonel Oslin, Ranger buddy of mine, Tommy, People I've known for a very long time, Brother Donner back there that I met several years ago at a, at a West Point function in Lehigh Valley, uh, Founders Day function, where I did some speaking and he was thinking about coming to the academy still. So it's really good to be with you all. And along those lines, there's a story I like to tell a West Point audience. And it's about my friend Darcy St. Amant. She's a lieutenant colonel now. When I was a senior at the academy in 1994, Darcy was a plebe. So we got four years between us. Had I known that 18 years later, Darcy would ask me for advice after she had been selected for battalion command, this year 2013, she had been selected for battalion command. Had I known that 18 years into my army journey, she'd be asking me for advice, would I have treated Darcy differently back in 1994? Had I known that this young lady who was 19 years old at the time, would I have given her more time? Would I have given her more energy? Would I have given her more of my attention? had I known that 18 years into my career, she'd be asking me for advice about battalion command. So our army is not made up of people, it is people. And I'd ask you all to not get lost in trying to knock down targets on your journey, but to try and enjoy it. Do the best you can with your feet are, take care of each other, all right? These guys right here, I mean, literally my best friend uh, from when I was a cadet is in the room right now. Mike Mobb's good to see you, man. And so, you know, the, I just tell you, it is people, so enjoy it, you should. A lot of you kind of be focused on, hey, I gotta get to graduation. If I just get through spring break, if I just get through ranger school, if I just get through the next field problem, if I just get through the deployment, that's no way to live, okay? I really challenge you to accept it, embrace it, enjoy the journey, because it's fascinating, all right? Today, what I'd like to talk to you about, and then we'll, we'll leave some time for some Q&A here, I'd like to talk to you about the fight for Mosul and how the Iraqis dominated them, uh, dominated ISIS. So first thing we'll do is we'll kind of unpack who I think ISIS is, this so-called caliphate. Then we'll talk about the Iraqi security forces, my optic on who our partner was. We we'll talk about how the fight unfolded on the whiteboard in very simple terms, and, and Henry and Sydney will call me out if I'm lying. They were there too. And then we'll kind of talk about what we can take away from it, all right? And then we'll, t we'll talk about whatever you want to after that. Going in, my position on this. When it comes to combat advising, like any coalition warfare, there's a humility and empathy 
and there's a pragmatism that we all have to have, I think. So when I think of the Iraqi security forces, I think of a coalition. The Army prepares a brigade combat team to go to war, right? The Army does that. That's the secretary and the chief of staff's duty, to prepare brigade combat teams or combat aviation brigades or fires brigades. Then we go and we fight as a joint force. But we win as a coalition. And that's kind of an important perspective that I'd offer you all as we walk through this. So I don't really have anything novel. Many of you are, nothing here I'm going to say is going to surprise you. But it is my perspective on all this, all right? And I recognize it's all on the record, so. Here we go. The Islamic State. Someone tell me about ISIS, the so-called caliphate. Who knows something about it? Throw it out there. Who is ISIS? Who's the adversary? Okay. Let's start with this then. What is the difference between Al-Qaeda Central, Bin Ladenism, and what Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was able to do? What's the core difference? Yeah, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, I mean, he did what everybody else couldn't. So the quest for the caliphate has always been part of the global Salafist Jihad. It's always been a core concept. But Osama bin Laden said, we're not ready for that. We need to attack the far enemy. In Al-Qaeda in Iraq, this Zarqawiism. Zarqawi flipped the whole thing on his head because he said, no, no, the enemy is not the United States. The enemy is who? Who's the enemy to Zarqawi? the first super affiliate of Al-Qaeda. Who was his enemy? Other Shia Muslims. He said, that's the enemy. That's what's keeping us. And then Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi had a vision. So let's talk about this vision. What is Salafism? Does anybody understand Salafism? Someone help me out. Okay. The Salafist believes that the subjugation of Muslim peoples has occurred because they've drifted too far from what? Yeah, who is the perfect Muslim for the Salafist? Who is the perfect? Who is it? Muhammad. The year 632 he died. So the Salafist wants to take it back to the 7th century because he or she believes that it was perfect then. It was kind of like this utopian lie that they sell. This is what ISIS says. We'll take it back to the 7th century and that will cure all of our ills. That's the promise. And that is what underpins all of this. So Osama bin Laden, his approach was, we got to attack the Americans because they're the ones with all these vassal states in the Muslim world. They're the ones planted in Saudi Arabia. They're the ones backing the state of Israel. We need to attack America. Osama bin Laden declared war on Jews and crusaders, right? He declared war. And then he acted on it. He put together a pretty sophisticated operation, right? Essentially kind of like a tactical nuke. That sort of sophistication, that sort of punishing violence. And he was able to organize that. The problem for him is it'll never be September 10th, 2001 ever again. The whole world came down on him. When's the last time that Al-Qaeda's core organized an operation and pulled it off? July 2005, man, they're on life support. But the idea lives, right? 2003. The invasion of Iraq. What was the ruling minority sect of Islam? Sunni. 30% of the population dominated governance. 60% of the population was on the outside looking in, really leaning toward Iran, right, for support. What happened? What happened very quickly? De yeah, debathification. So the policy is essentially anybody in the bath party's out and the entire government Power flipped immediately, right? So now the Shia control it. Out of that emerges this guy, Zarqawi. What was Zarqawi's mission? What was he trying to do? He had a vision for the caliphate, but he was just like a street thug, man. Street cred in Al-Qaeda in Iraq was different. Al-Qaeda core is a bunch of elites. How many of them was there on 9-11? Al-Qaeda's core. A couple hundred? Zarqawi, if you could fight, you could get a job, you could get prestige, you could fight your way up the ranks. He was a street commander. And he brought the jihad to Iraq. And he decided, I have a strategy. And what was his strategy to make un Iraq unravel? St sectarian war, right? So he essentially condemned the majority of Iraq to death, right? 60% of the population. Zarqawi set it ablaze. 
Out of this grows this other thing. So what I'm telling you, Al-Qaeda's core, damaged, it's remnants, life support, hasn't pulled off an operation since London in July of 05. Move forward. Al-Qaeda in Iraq sort of killed itself. And it grew, and it became something else. And this guy named Abu Dua was sitting in Old Mosul in 2008, and he had a vision. And what was his vision? What was Abu Dua's vision? He said, I'm going to start my state. I'm going to do it. And he capitalized on the crowning catastrophe of the, of the Syrian civil war, right? And he built his army in Syria, and he invaded in 2014. And on the way, he renamed himself what? Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Okay? This guy had a vision. He's a serious guy. So ISIS invades. Starts in January of 14. Got the army lined up. And a lot of people knew it was happening. He invades into Sunni areas. Why? Why? There's plenty of people there who probably wanted a change, right? Ramadi, Fallujah, Tikrit, Mosul, Nineveh province. Probably wanted a change, right? Because you got the disenfranchised Sunni who lost everything in 2003. And they're ready for change. He marches his army. So here's how Pat Work describes ISIS. If ISIS is anything, it's an army. It's predicated on a couple principles. One, it must always expand. Why? Remember who ISIS is. What's the Salafist believe? Why does, why does the Muslim world have problems, according to the Salafist? They've drifted too far from what? The prophet. Why must, why must ISIS always expand? Why must it march all the time? Because God knows no boundaries. That is an innovation by infidels. That's a secular innovation. They're on a war of conquest and they're serious about it. Okay? Number two, because they must always attack and expand, they must always do what? They're always at war. They must always fight because they can't stop expanding. And they did it once before. Anybody who knows their history, you know, these things, the Crusades were fought for a reason. This is, I mean, they were dominant in the Med. They were dominant in North Africa, right? They were dominant in the Middle East. And then a whole bunch of colonial tinkering over time changed things. They must always expand. Therefore, they're always going to be at war. Therefore, ISIS, if it's anything, is an army. And here's how it manifests itself in close combat. On the final days of the fight for West Mosul, in a little place that they call the Old City District, Right up until July 16th was the day that we did our last coalition strike. Right up until the very end. The infirm were fighting to the death. Women were leading their children to their death. It's not that they don't love their four kids. What does the intoxicating ISIS narrative promise for martyrdom? Paradise, Paradise man. It's the only promise, right? The only surefire way to get to paradise is to martyr yourself. So when you see a young mother with her four children wearing explosives, walking out like she is giving up and then cooking herself off, it's not that she doesn't love her children. She wants to win. ISIS is an army if it's anything. All right, so it must always expand. It's always an army. Let's talk about ISIS, its character. Does it try to win hearts and minds? What does it do to hearts and minds? It cuts them out of your chest and skull. It's about intimidation. And if you think of what ISIS does, must always expand, will always be at war, therefore it acts like an army. Intimidates everybody. That's its first step to governance. All of this is a pretext for politics. It's a fight, in the end, of a Salafist, jihadist state against Damascus and Baghdad. What religious sect controls Damascus and Baghdad today? The Shia, right? So it plays out in a context. There's a context for the contest. Okay, so my take on ISIS here, if we boil it down, it's an army if it's anything. And we'll come back to that in a moment here. Number two, because it must always expand, it will always be at war. That's all it is built to do. Okay, the state is built to make war. 
The problem is you can't take on everybody all the time, and they're not very good to begin with. Mosul fell in five days for a reason, right? In June of 14, Mosul fell in five days because there are some very real, it'd be naive to suggest there's not a sectarian backdrop to this whole thing. There was a lot of people that were like, good, ISIS is coming. Liberation. They'll protect us from Baghdad or whatever. So it's a complicated political environment. And the Iraqis know this better than anyone. All right? Additionally, ISIS had about two years to prepare the defense of Mosul. That's a long time, man. And a di I'll, I'll tell you what. It would be, an ar it would be a, a defense that any army would have a hard time penetrating. Yes, we would dominate the ISIS defense, certainly. But we would pay a steep toll in blood to do so. Okay? I mean, they built a defense. Here's what they did to the city of Mosul. They took every building, knocked out every wall, and they built bunkers out of everything. They took hospitals, the biggest hospital in Mosul. It's called Jamuri Hospital Complex. It would be like a teaching hospital. Massive place. They turned it into essentially the ISIS Pentagon. All the while, they're doing hospital work down there, surgery and everything else. Because ISIS built a state. ISIS called for, all, what did ISIS want? It didn't want fighters only. What did it want? It wanted doctors, it wanted lawyers, it wanted engineers, it wanted academics, it wanted to build a country. I once in East Mosul walked into a factory where ISIS was building aircraft. Now they look like Frankenstein, a propeller from here, a cupola for here, wheels from that, but their engineers had built a whole bunch of airplanes. I'm sure none of them were airworthy, I'm sure none of them flew, but they wanted to. The conviction is extraordinary. They wanted to win, okay? That's ISIS. And we'll come back to them. Who are the Iraqi security forces? All right, what happened in 1979 in Iran? Right, the revolution started, right? The revolution started. It's important. Over 50 Americans were held for more than 400 days. That happened in our lifetime. And we were enfeebled, we feckless. We didn't do anything about it. We couldn't do anything about it. That was 1979. 1979 is a big year. Saddam came to power in 79. What did Saddam do right away? He said, oh, hell no, we're not going to have a theocracy next door. And he invaded, and the war cooked off, right? It set off this chain of events, you could argue. And it's hard to get cause and effect, but at least sequentially it went down this way. Saddam invades in 80. They slug it out for eight years. Saddam's broke. He invades what in 90? Roger. He gets smashed by who in 91? A coalition led by the United States. Okay? In 1980... Who were the generals who lived through the Iran-Iraq war? What was their grade in 1980? They were like, you all, lieutenants and captains. These are the three and two-star generals that are running the counter-ISIS campaign. Important perspective. They remember an army that had 34 armor divisions. You know why they resent Saddam Hussein? Not because he was sectarian. What they will say about Saddam Hussein is, if you had game, he embraced you. It didn't matter. Sunni, Shia, he didn't care. He wanted people with skills. He had 34 armor divisions at the apex of their capacity. Today they have one. They resent him because he destroyed the army, because he invaded and you know, kind of ground it down in Iran, turned around and got it beat up by a coalition led by America, then irritated the West again in 2003 and got it annihilated. Total collapse. That's why they resent Saddam Hussein. These guys were lieutenants, they were captains. In 91, these were the poor air defenders out there as we're driving F-18s, killing them, right? Think about their perspective. They've been on the business end of American military might. What, what do you say on the days when they're wobbling and you say, hey, I, I, I can't do anything about that drone? These are the guys that their perspective is, are you kidding me? Everybody I fought with back in 91 got killed. And you can't do anything about that drone they bought at Costco? Okay, it's perspective. It's important that you guys be empathetic and you kind of try to understand the 180 on people. And you, you put yourself in their shoes. Understand who you're partnered with. Understand who you're fighting. Okay, in 2003, Staff Lieutenant General Abdul Amir, uh, whom when Colonel Austin was working for the CENTCOM commander, General Votel would come to visit. We would always, when the big guys would come, we would always make sure that they got time with General Abdul Amir. Always, because he was essentially their combatant commander. He was the chief for the counter-ISIS campaign in Iraq. And uh, uh, I have a lot of respect for this man. In 2003, 
he was wounded by Americans fighting at Haditha Dam. So here I am, his combat advisor, and on April 6, 2003, that's the first day I set foot in Baghdad, I told him, Sadie, you know, kind of in this, hey, let's just talk. Sadie, I got a story for you. Man, it's amazing. 14 years ago today, I set foot in Baghdad. He said, 14 years ago today, I was in the hospital because I'd been wounded by you all at Haditha. I mean, these are the guys that we're going all in on now. Same guys that we tried to kill. And don't kid yourselves, cadets. American military is brutal. What our soldiers will do when we train them right and we have trained discipline and fit organizations, they exist for one thing, to dominate ground combat. And they're good at it. And that is my whole goal in life is to get better at it. I go to bed in the morning or go to bed, go bed at night and wake up in the morning thinking about how can we get better at dominating our enemies in ground combat. Okay? That's what we do. So the Iraqi army generals and the Iraqi police generals and the counterterrorism service generals that we partnered with, these are the guys that did the thing where they're like, oh man, we had 34 divisions, we lost a lot of it fighting Iran, then oh my gosh, what are we doing? The Americans pummeled us in 91, and then in 2003, but these are the guys that we're trying to help win, okay? That's an important perspective about them. We talk about, I told you earlier, coalitions win, right? We win as a coalition. Let's talk about the most important member of the coalition. What is it? Who is always the number one member of the coalition? My perspective, anyway. Host the host nation in this context, right? In this context, it would be the host nation. We need you to come help us win. Return our sovereign soil and our population to us. They're the number one members of the coalition. So let's talk about their coalition. All right. Three members. The federal police, which is a national police force, not local police that do community policing, but a national police force that they can project to places and provide security. The Iraqi army, which used to have 34 armor divisions and now is down to one, which is the generals that we were hunting down when they were lieutenants and majors and colonels, and the counterterrorism services, which is their CT force, a non-sectarian organization that's really got some capability. These guys can kill men for the country. They're good fighters, and they're nasty, and they're fast, okay? So you got these three different organizations. I would argue they had their own coalition. We over-homogenize the partner when we describe them as the Iraqi security forces and leave it at that. Because just as we took legislation in our country to force the services to cooperate, to coordinate, to integrate, remember? 1986, it took the Congress to act after some catastrophes, right? Many would argue that not only a problem in 79 with a failed hostage rescue, 83, a lot of problems in Grenada, right? 86, we have legislation that forces us to interact. Well, they don't have that over there. But what they do have is they got their own coalition, the police, the counterterrorism services, and the army. And General Abdul Amir, whom I advised, spent most of his calories not on working out blue lines on the map, Doing what? Holding his coalition together. He was like their Eisenhower, literally. So when I talk about the coalition, it's their coalition, and I marveled at this man. I have massive respect for this man on very hard days, days when they had 100 die, how he could hold this thing together. Because like all coalitions, they all have their own interests too, right? So let's talk about what I learned about coalition warfare. I think this is important. One, we should always listen. We should listen. If I'm truly here to help you, I should listen to you. It's rule number one, listen. Rule number two, and this is important in the technique we use for combat advice. Um, let me go with darker coat. The technique we use to combat advise. All right? We talk about A and A, advise and assist. We should always listen. Two, we gotta maintain contact with the partner. So my mantra is this, it's never too late, you're never too far, and I will entertain any reasonable request you have where I can help you. Because I have interest too, I wanna win too. I am here to help you win, okay? That in the essence of fighting by, with, and through a partner, it's not cliche. This is my take on by, with, and through, and I share this with a lot of people who have kind of experienced or tinkered with this kind of warfare. 
by, with, and through. It's all predicated on their ownership, their leadership. That's what makes it by, with, and through. Because they take responsibility for their operations. And that's what happened in Mosul. We advised them. We assisted them. We did a heck of a lot for them. We did it together. But they owned it. They led it. You got to be realistic. That's the third. So if I'm always listening, I maintain contact with the partner. Hey, whatever you need. Uh, candidly, who do you think made more contact than, well, Gary knows. I mean, she probably knows. Who probably made the most contact in the Falcon Brigade? No. It was guys like me following the generals to the fight. Because Iraqi generals do this. Iraqi generals, they fight like we expect our battalion commanders to fight. Hey, man, they're stopped up at the breach. What's the battalion commander do with his 17, 18 years of experience? He or she moves forward and takes control and dominates the situation. That's how Iraqi generals fight, because they got to urge and spur and get their people moving, right, on really hard days. One, you got to listen. Two, you got to maintain contact with them. That's why the advisors made a lot of, you know, if anybody was getting shot at or mortared, it was typically us, because we were moving with them. Three, you got to be realistic. Right? So if I'm listening to you, and everybody kind of understands a Venn diagram, if I'm listening to you and this is what you're saying, and then I come in and I understand what, you know, my interests are, and now we kind of map out our interests, okay, that's a good place to start as a combat advisor. We'll work in that space for a little while. And ideally, you know, we have interests too, right? Which is going to bring me to my fourth point here in a moment. Ideally, we can start to get additional overlap, Okay. Because number four is, don't ever forget your interests. And when you have leverage, have the willpower to use it. That's what I've learned about coalition warfare. One, listen. Two, maintain contact with the partner. Three, be realistic. They're not us. We don't lead ourselves. We don't partner with ourselves, right? That's important. I, I told you earlier, you know, would I have treated her differently had I known that I'd be talking to her as a lieutenant colonel? I, I thought I'd treated her well. I just wondered, you know, it's like, holy cow, man, I can't believe maybe I would have put more into her back then if I had known. Here's another one for you. You don't lead yourself. You're not partnered with yourself. Your perspective is only yours. Okay? That's important. Because I'm always listening. I'm always maintaining contact. I'm realistic because I'm not partnered with myself. I'm not leading myself. And then when I do, though, when I have leverage and our interests are at stake, I have the guts to assert myself as an advisor. And you can't do that unless you've already done what? Think about any of you that are married. How did I know that Mara was the right one for me? Largely because when she tuned me up, I knew I still love her. We had invested in the relationship so that we could get past the hard days. Okay, and the same, same thing with a partner. You invest, you invest, you invest. Hey, I gotta withdraw. I gotta put my finger in his chest today. Because that's why I drove all over the place with him. That's why I followed him up. That's why I let us get ambushed that day. So that right now, right here, we can have this argument. Because our interests are at stake and I need to help him keep moving in our direction too. Coalitions, all right? So hopefully that's informative to you. The Iraqi security forces, who they are, who the generals were, how they had their own coalition, and then how we, as the team trying to help them dominate, how we fit in on that. All right, let's go to this then, and then we'll start talking about the fight itself. And we got about 10 minutes, and we'll transition to, uh, to some Q&A. All right, advise and assist. Let's talk about advice. That's, that's kind of simple. What do you think combat advising means, the advice? You give your best military advice, right? Hey, here's some options for you. One thing about the Iraqis, they never start with the red pen. You must start with the red pen. How can you win if you don't know what your enemy's going to do? you got to start with the red pen. Let me tell you about the Iraqi coalition. They never start with the red pen. What they do is they say, man, this is Mosul, Tigris River, right down the middle, okay? you got a West Mosul, you got an East Mosul. The Iraqis, to keep their coalition together, and for them, it's very first order. It's like, I'll take a third, you take a third. That's kind of their approach to things. We each get a third. Meanwhile, we're backstopping them. All right, we're doing intel-driven advice and assist. We're backstopping them saying, whoa, Sadie, if you do that, you just gave this guy a real big problem. Because they never start with the red pen. And when the general draws lines, they fall in until they say no because it's a coalition, right? And so it's always this negotiation, but the red pen never comes out. So advice, our advice was always grounded in the red pen, okay? 
don't ever, I, any intel officer that's ever, oh, well, Jessica knows this for sure. I mean, <laughs> am I my own intel officer or what? I mean, Brigarov knows that. I mean, this is, you gotta be your own intel officer. You, as the platoon leader or the commander, will develop a fingertip sense for what's happening. You have much more inputs than most of your intel analysts. If you don't take them to the field with you to taste it and feel it and see it, you're getting it from the commanders, you're getting it from the higher headquarters, you're getting it from your staff, you're getting it from everywhere. So your picture is much more comprehensive. Our advice was largely driven by the red pen. Hey, I don't care what you do, but I'm gonna give you my best advice based on what we think the enemy's doing. Now, there's risk in that because what might happen? I could be wrong, right? But if you love them and the relationship's there and you're like, man, I would never put you in a position, Sadie, where you didn't have the best opportunity to get advantage that you couldn't. I would never try to do that for you. But it's your decision. I support you, whatever you do. That we rearrange and we'll come back to that. All right? So that's, that's the advice. Assist. What's assist? Assist kind of like, you know, it's, it's like lethal manifestation fires. Coalition fires. In the end, what did we really do to help the Iraqis? As simple as you can boil it down. I'd encourage you, kind of a third rule, always battle complexity with simplicity. Keep it simple. In its simplest frame, what did we do for the Iraqis? In its simplest. Two words. One of them's an acronym. It's ISIS. What's the first word? Killed ISIS. That's what we did to help them the most. We killed the enemy in front of them. A lot. Okay? So if you think about assist, I'm just trying to help you understand. Advise, assist. Here's my red pen thinking. This is all about the thinking. This is about bringing our potential for war to bear at the right place at the right time to help them dominate. Okay, third, a company. What I tell you had to do. One, you gotta be, you gotta listen. Two, you gotta do what? Maintain. Maintain contact so that you can listen, right? That's where you gotta accompany them. And that's why I told you it was like the advisor teams. Now this was a very, for lack of a better term, a very commander-centric mission in the sense that the company troop battery commanders, the battalion squadron commanders, myself as a brigade commander, the CJ Flick commander, the CJTF commander, and General Botel when he would come. We literally would align this whole thing and we were able to achieve a synergy uh, through a lot of hard work and a lot of over-communicating where we were trying to move. And when General Votel would come with Colonel Oslin as my witness, we would try and tee him up to be our finisher with the Iraqis. He's a four banger, man, he's a CENTCOM commander. If he can go in there and help us help them, it's powerful. And they're all kind of speaking with the same voice and it's their voice, but it's refined from the bottom up all the time, okay? It's more of a network. My analogy for the way we fought, I call us the lethal OCT network, the imperfect analogy. Any of you have ever been to a combat training center? You know, you got the guys walking around all around you and they're kind of annoying because they're always talking about you. But what they really want to do, if they're good, they're trying to help you see yourself, see the enemy, see the terrain, and get better, right? The OCT network over you. Imagine if the OCs had massive amounts of bandwidth, massive amounts of coalition analytics and collection capacity, massive amount of fires capacity. If the OCs had a moral obligation to kill the enemy just like you did. That's what we were. We were the lethal OC network, okay? And that's kind of how we ran it, over communicating. We got this disciplined battle rhythm, forces us to communicate. Our messages are always tight. We always kind of understand what's going on. I'm out every day with General Abdul Amir, so I know what he says. They're all out. And we share every night, disciplined battle rhythm. Once again, I told you, the Army's not made up of people. It is people. People have to interact. That's why a battle rhythm or an operating rhythm matters. You should never cancel a battle rhythm meeting. We learned it from the same guy. This is how General McChrystal ran a worldwide global counterterrorism team on a disciplined battle rhythm, never canceling anything because the people got to interact. All right? That's what majors get paid to do. So we accompany. That gives us the shared understanding that we look for. All right, here's the next one. The next day, assurance. We already talked about the hard days. Okay, on the really hard days. On the really, really hard days. And what you can never replicate in training is the stress and the fear and the slaughter of combat. On the really hard days, we were with them. Sadie, I got your back. I'm bringing assets to bear. The Apaches are inbound. The bomber's gonna be here in 12 minutes. I would call them, so we think of non-lethal contact. To me, it's a mobile phone call to somebody. Hey man, I'm coming to help you. Good, now he's gonna stay in the fight. 
right? I would do it for you too. I'm coming to help you. I want you to win. Assurance. You have to assure the partner. Okay? Here's your fifth A. You got to anticipate. So again, I call it all six A's of A and A. It's not advise assist. It's advise assist. A company. Assure. Next one. We're going to anticipate because I'm always with you and I'm always listening. Now I can start to see, okay, we're starting to pull it together. ROC network is thinking faster than them now. All right? I'm anticipating. That's what majors get paid to do. And then finally, I'm agile. Our mantra in Falcon was they'll never have to wait for us. We would go on 50% of the information. If you read the way General Powell, when he was National Security Advisor to the President and when he was the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, he had a 40-70 rule, okay? And he would look at every decision and he would say, can I get by with 40% of the information to manage the risk on this decision or do I need 70%? He would never wait for 100. He operated in the 40 to 70%. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some, I need more because it's too high risk if it goes wrong. I, I, I kind of lived in that sort of thing. They'll never have to wait for us. As soon as we start to see what they think they're gonna do, and you guys know it, we would move people all over the place, all the time, building bases, moving artillery pieces, putting our teams in a position where they could help them win, all right? And so, if you kind of look at that construct and the fact that, I'm gonna boil down the fight for West Mosul for you real quickly. My team got there and we took over on the 19th of January. Okay, at that point, the fight on the east side was kind of down to a sliver and that's the first time uh, CENTCOM commander came out and uh, Colonel Lawson and we met up there in northeast and on that day alone, there were several Iraqis coming in, uh, missing limbs. Uh, there was a lot of fighting still happening on the east side. They wrapped that up by the 1st of February. So here's the environment about a year ago. All five bridges across the Tigris have been knocked out by us deliberately. We had knocked out at least one span on all five bridges. Additionally, on the west side, the west side was always harder. I told you that General Abdul Amir said no one lost more than the Moslawis in 2003. This was a place where generals lived, had vacation homes, state intel guys. They've kind of got like, you know, there's a river right there. So what happens on rivers? You got big villas and big houses. So a lot of rich people in some of these areas like 17th Tammuz, old cities down here, Mosul Airport. Some of you guys might remember Fab Merez. It doesn't exist anymore. Neither does Mosul Airport. It's gone. ISIS destroyed it. And the way this fight played out initially, because the way they don't start with the red pen team. I told you that. They don't start with the red pen. What do they do? They say, all right, you take a third, you take a third. I'm telling you, this is how the fight was happening from the 19th of February when they started on the west side until about the 1st of May. And it was a slaughter, it was a grind. It was a grind. You had one of them here. Yeah, I mean, it was just federal police drew the shortest straw because they ended up right next to the river. So on one hand, they didn't have to protect their eastern flank, but on the other hand, you know, they got to bump into the old city, which is bad, because that's, that's like where ISIS had its headquarters. Uh, you got the counterterrorism services that got like two squadrons. You got the army out here kind of enveloping 9th Iraqi Army Division. And that's how it kind of played out from the 19th of February. Here's a couple instances just so you understand how the violent the fighting was. On the 24th of February, on the 24th of February, the CTS down here on the south side hit swarms of 10 drone quadcopters dropping grenades on them. Okay, so swarms of 10 quadcopters coming out like ISIS had an Air Force. All of them rigged to drop 40 millimeter grenades on them. And while it didn't kill a lot of them, it killed their courage. It made them afraid. It made them not want to move, right? So what do you coach? Hey, when you're not attacking, you got to defend, cover, camouflage, concealment. And then we had to do some things that I'll come back to in a little while about innovation to help them. Where we said, man, cover, camouflage, concealment, that ain't working. We got to do something fast. And we had some people solve some problems. Okay? So that's, that's kind of happening. And I told you that's the 24th of February. That's the big swarms. On the 12th of March, this is extraordinary. On the 12th of March, 12 V-bids hit the federal police in one platoon area. 12 suicide car bombs. Smashed them. And it became clear to us, because again, they don't do the red pen, and the coalition, the OC net, helps them talk across their boundaries. Not only are we trying to keep ourselves aware, we're trying to keep, help them stay aware. Never tell the partner. 
Help the partner tell the partner. Okay? I'm not going to tell you, but I want that guy to tell you, so we work our OC net to get them talking. So they start talking across the boundaries a little better. That's a good thing. That's about the 1st of March or so. On the 12th of March, 12 suicide bevids hit the same spot. About a week later, some poor guy in the federal police turned into the old city accidentally, took a wrong turn at night. That was about 1,500. First guy was beheaded on the news by 1,700. Okay? I mean, it's hard, hard stuff. And it had kind of grind down. So by mid-April, the flat just wasn't moving. We're killing ISIS. We're killing a lot of them because they're all on this side. ISIS is vulnerable because it fights like an army, right? It's not an insurgency and it doesn't want to be one. It wants to be a state. These guys wanted their own country. All their guns are oriented this way. All their eyes are oriented this way. And these guys are just smashing into it. And when you fight the same, get in the boxing ring. If I fight you four, four days in a row, pretty soon I'm going to figure everything out about you. ISIS defense was predicated on four, four, my four features. This is my description of it. When you look at this, the suicide car bomb. The suicide car bomb's a flat out killer. As soon as the Iraqis would bring forward a tank or an engineer asset knowing that they were gonna breach, what did ISIS turn loose on them? Suicide car bomb, man, it was like quick reaction force. Boom, hit them. That was their high payoff target list for suicide bombers. They would hit tanks and they would hit blades as soon as they'd enter. Two, they rely on three to five man squads. It doesn't matter if they're skilled marksmen or not. Think about this. If I were to go to your barracks and knock out every wall in between, my three to five shooters could descend up and down and we could work laterally with total freedom. On the outside, it looks like houses. On the inside, it's nothing but fighting positions because they had two years to prepare. So those three to five have sniper-like effects. When we're fighting street to street, those three to five are in dominant vantage points, bunkered in. They fire so there's no muzzle flash so we can't see it. They fire from within the room. It's all stabilized. It's just not at the windowsill anymore because they have prepared. And they know what they're doing. They want to win. Three to five man squads, that's the second feature. Third feature, centralized command and control. These are two essentially Arab armies fighting each other, right? So we got the state force coming this way, and we got the so-called caliphate fighting that way. Dramatic centralization of their command and control. How does it manifest itself? It manifests itself like this. I already told you. I got my high payoff target list. They're bringing the tanks up. Boom, send the car bomber. Okay? It manifests itself with their mortars. They had massive amounts of mortars. They fired mortars 206 times on the federal police alone on one day in February last year. Okay? That's, and that's what we detected, which we only see a little bit of it in this sort of environment. 206. Here's what they would do. And you can tell. They got a battery commander. They got all their mortarmen out. I got 100 rounds because I got to budget this, right? It's a checkbook. I want to win. I want to be the Islamic State when this is all over. I can only afford to shoot 100 a day. You would literally see 50 shots fired here, 50 shots fired here. And then when these guys started to penetrate, you'd see 80-20. The commanders had strict central control. And you could tell when the commanders were on the battlefield because ISIS fought. Their commanders want to win. I told you, Zarqawi, Zarqawi, if you had street cred and you could fight, you got a job, right? Their commanders, you became a general in ISIS because you were good, not because you were a favored son, okay? Because they were good. And then the final feature, when you fight someone the same day for what amounted to six months at this point, the fourth feature is every time that we're going to slow down, pause, stop, stall, you see it because you see the same signature all the time when we do that. As soon as, they start, as soon as the trucks park like that and as soon as they put out, as soon as they start building berms in front of them, good, they ain't coming anymore. ISIS depended on that inactivity. The times when the Iraqi security forces had to reorganize and refit, recock themselves for the next assault. Okay? So four, four factors, the suicide car bomb, nasty, killer, intimidating. Two, three to five man squads that would just grind you down at that forward line. Three, centralized command and control, four, ISF inactivity. And you know, again, you gotta be empathetic. They're the ones in there bleeding. We have interest too, so you encourage, you do what you must, but this is how it gets, when I talk about boiling it down to what we did, what did I tell you? Two words, kill ISIS. And we did it precisely. There's probably, I can't imagine a more precise strike, uh, set of strikes than what we were doing every day. In fact, uh, Nat Geo is doing a little documentary right now. It's called Chain of Command. 
And uh, one of the recent teasers that's out there for next week's episode, someone sent it to me yesterday, is a precision guided kit hitting the fourth floor of a building. Check it out. It's extraordinary what we can do with our artillery when they're well-trained, disciplined, and fit. All right. So this fight grinds on, and now you start to see this sort of anvil. That's what I called it. All right? Called it the anvil. Because on the 4th of May, the army finally came down and in. Here comes the hammer. Okay, ISIS is vulnerable because it fights like an army. It's vulnerable because it only has so much capacity. It's vulnerable because it's surrounded and it's starving in there. But it can't fight in two directions because of its central control. If you put only one problem to it, it will grind and grind and grind. As soon as you start to, oh goodness, I don't have enough talent for this. Now the army, the 9th Division, the only armored division in the Iraqi army on the 4th of May is attacking my northwest flank. Panic. Okay? It was violent, but it went down. So that we got to a, a point here by the 1st of June. It went fast, three weeks. Now we got a bridge in up here. We're connecting the east to the west. Meanwhile, on the east side, I'm telling you, they got like discotheques going. They got men and women going to Mosul University. You walk down the street, when we took the CENTCOM commander, um, you, you had already left. I mean, we drank chai in the streets of East Mosul while the fight's happening on the west side. You know, I mean, they're extraordinarily resilient. And now we got a bridge in there by late May. And this is the Iraqis doing this. What we are doing for them, I told you. Intel-driven advice, we kill ISIS, we stay with them, we assure them on the hard days, we anticipate their next problem. They never have to wait for us. We help keep them going. And for me, it's all about pressure and momentum. We cannot stop. So I would let my battalion commanders fight this thing. You know, my, my mantra is in command, out of control. I don't try to command, I mean, I don't try to control this thing. I try to command it. I don't try to control it. In command, out of control. They get a chuckle out of it, but that's how I try to roll. You know what you got to do? Go do it. Let me know when there's a problem and I'm moving to the sound of the guns for you. Hey, when we would start to wobble and be like, man, I don't know if we should keep going, that might be a discussion I would have with someone. No, we need to keep going. I need more. We need to pour it on now. Okay? By the 1st of June, Old City actually went remarkably quick. It started on the 22nd of June. If you recall, by the, by the 24th, they had dropped. You, you recall the Nuri Mosque? ISIS blew up the Nuri Mosque itself, the same place that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi announced his caliphate. Blew that up by the 24th. They grounded down for about another block to block. Old City is like a city like Aleppo or Jerusalem, one of these cities of antiquity. It's like biblical Nineveh up there. Um, city that was raised, built over again, raised, built over, four dimensions, catacombs and everything. Nasty, nasty fighting. ISIS fighters to the death on the 16th of July. I told you, women leaving their kids to their deaths. The infirmed fighting from wheelchairs. If ISIS is anything, it's an army. And the Iraqi security forces backed by a whole bunch of encouragement and persistent, precise violence by us kept going until on July 16th, we did our last strike in West Mosul. And, uh, you know, the proof's in the execution. Raqqa was under pressure at the same time. Raqqa went down, so this is massive. This right here, catastrophic setback. The Iraqis destroyed their army in Mosul. They went all in on Mosul, and they lost it. Raqqa was going down too at the same time. So the global capital of the caliphate and then the crown jewel of the caliphate all went down in a 90-day period. The fight west of Mosul that happened about six weeks after the 16th of July, we wrapped this one up, or the Iraqis wrapped this up. They start their attack on Talafer, about 50 kilometers to the west, on the 20th of August. In that five-week period, we struck persistently, unrelenting, on Talafer, killing ISIS the whole time, shaping that for them. The Iraqis learn. After they did their hammer and anvil, how many axes do you think they attacked Talafer on? Four. Okay? Four. They surrounded them and they hit them from every direction. Do you think they started to learn to use the red pen? Do you think they started getting addicted to our intel? Talafer went down in 12 days. I attribute that to the pressure in Raqqa, the destruction of the army in Mosul, and five weeks of shaping and then four axis of attack by the Iraqis. It went down in 12 days. They started on the 20th of August by the 1st of September. When I left, Brian Sullivan, our classmate, came in with 3rd Brigade, 10th Division. And uh, we were starting to help them arrange. Again, you can't wait. The Iraqis ain't waiting. They put a stake in the ground. They said, we're going. We're going on the 15th of September. Oh, gosh, we better get moving. 4070. 
manage the risk, be agile. They shouldn't have to wait for us. We were putting everything in place in Huija. So as soon as Brian's team took over, they started fighting Huija. Huija went down in like 10 days. Then they went all the way to the Syrian border. ISIS is on life support. Its army's destroyed. The idea lives. Okay? And so I hope, uh, I'm going to wrap this up now because what we got, like five minutes or something? Five minutes? What, time's it, what time are we done here? Okay. All right, we, we got time for three or four questions. I'm sorry I talked so long. Um, I hope that was informative to you. I hope that helps. All right, Colonel Austin asked me specifically to talk about one thing, and I will. I told you we had a drone problem down here where it wasn't, you know, you don't have to kill your enemy if you kill his courage, right? And we were getting to the point in late February where the Iraqi security forces were you know, just intimidated. Air guards matter, team. Just look up and see the problem. That helps, right? Camouflage yourself, conceal yourself. Don't make it easy for the enemy. I mean, I, I commanded off of five big ideas. If you want to know my intent for the fight in Mosul, I had five ideas, and they were aligned under my boss. But they were aligned in a way, see, here's what I don't do. I don't write commander's intent for my boss. I write it for my subordinates. So I do it in simple, simple English that comes off my tongue, that's instinctive to me, that I believe in. And I commanded off of five big ideas. The first one. Protect our team. That was, the, that was the first one. Two, because I'm telling you, this a company thing, and, and Colonel Oslin knows this, at the highest levels of government, this a company thing, this is a strategic dilemma. If we start getting in a whole bunch of problems, if it gets rough for us, we will probably start walking back. So to stay in the fight, we had to protect our team. Protect our team, that's number one. Two, the Iraqis are always the main effort. What's the problem if an advisor gets ambushed? Who just became the main effort? Who just became the main effort? Where's all of our resources going? I know from firsthand experience, they're coming to help me, right? The Iraqis are the main effort. So don't get in contact, right? Protect yourself. The Iraqis are always main effort. Third, attack ISIS. That's as simple as I can make it. That's the third idea, attack ISIS. Attack them all the time, day, night, home away. I don't care, attack them. Four, shared understanding. This whole OC network that we have, this discipline battle rhythm that we have, how do we communicate with each other on a fixed agenda, answering the CG's IRs, his information requirements, but informing ourselves and informing our partners. And then five, be agile. They should never have to wait for us. And I said the same things over and over. That's how, that's how I commanded the team. And then I made decisions when I had to, 40, 70. It's not perfect. And I assured our team, hey, I got this. I own the risk. We're moving forward. Okay? What my teams did and what they did about this drone, I have a battalion commander who had something that was built for base defense. It doesn't look a whole lot different than this. It literally doesn't make a whole lot. It's built to go on a, on a fire base or a patrol base. Okay? But well, what'd they do? These guys overnight said, I know what to do. If we could just take that thing to the fight, because this thing worked, it could break that little link. Okay? It could break the little link with the drone. Man, we just got this thing up there. Hey, I know what to do. Send a truck. Put it on there. Strap it down. Hey, sir, the guy who fixes this thing, the contractor says this is a violation of the rule. I don't care. Move forward. And these guys go forward and they start knocking down drones. What happens when you knock down a drone? The Iraqis pick it up. They bring it back to you. There's fingerprints all in that thing. Not literally, but technically, right? Technical. Now I can find you and I can kill you. And who is staring at the screen on the drone, the commander is. So when we start attacking you in your command post, killing you because we're chasing the drone back, all that little technical trail that you left inside the memory of that drone, and we're killing you in your own house, killing you in your command post. Problem went away pretty fast, okay? And a battalion commander and his NCOs figured this out. And we rode that thing, oh, how can we do two of those? Right, right? How can we move one up here on the east side so we could get into the fight? So if you think of like a fire base, what you would do forward with your artillery, we essentially had our little counter UAS fire base and it was a mobile fire base and we'd move it around, okay? And assured the partner. So when they're saying, man, are you kidding me? You're the United States, you can't knock down 10 drones? We figured, it, they figured out a way to do it. And that's just a simple in command, out of control. Don't try and control it. You all as platoon leaders are kind of like at the control level, right? Because you got team leaders who can literally grab people and say, stop moving. And you gotta, got a little bit of control. So there's five principles of patrolling. Number one is always common sense. Number two is always control. 
The further you get away from that, though, at the brigade level, your control gets vastly looser. I have no idea what the 4,300 paratroopers and Falcon Brigade are doing right now. I have no idea. But I know they're generally, most of them, most of the time, are doing what we want them to. <laughs> right? But that's how that's, I'm in command. I'm out of control. You all are going to enter at that level where you do have control. Squad, stop. Establish the base of fire. Bring the guns forward. Let's fight. Okay? All right, I think we're out, we're out of time, right? Yes, yeah, sir, we're actually out of time. Join me in giving uh, Colonel Ward a round of applause, please.